Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C., and Harvard Bookstore in Boston, Mass., it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Julie Clam to discuss the almost legendary Morris Sisters, a true story of family fiction published by our friends at Riverhead Books. Julie Clam is the author of the New York Times bestselling, You Had Me at Wolf, Love at First Bark, Friend Keeping, Please Excuse My Daughter, and The Stars in Our Eyes. She has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, People, and other publications. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Matthew Clam, Matthew is the author of the novel, Who is Rich? A 2017 New York Times notable book, and Sam the Cat, winner of the Penn Robert Bingham Prize for a debut short story collection. His writing has been featured in such places as The New Yorker, Harper's, and The New York Times Magazine. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of the almost legendary Morris Sisters from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button or visit the Politics and Prose or Harvard Bookstore websites to order from your neighborhood indie bookstores. We truly appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Welcome. Okay. Here we are. Is that it? something echoing? Okay, so do either one of you have any tabs open on your computers no. other than because it could be when you got on, if you left your closed, yes. email open. Oh, 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 yeah. It's you. I'm I'm two. Okay, try closing that extra tab. I'm gonna turn off your microphone for a minute. Try closing the extra tab. Any extra tabs? Oh, okay, let, let's well, try it now. Yeah, How that was it. That was, was it. I was on to. Uh, Knew I should have gotten a professional. <laughs> there you go. Okay, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, Julie, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you that I've had you removed from our parents' will. I don't know <laughs> when we go live if we're going to have to deal with any of this. But. <laughs> well, that just screwed up uh, my. Yeah. Was that your joke? Um, I was trying to think today. Yes. Where do I know you from? Did we meet it? <laughs> McDowell, or was it that Sydney Sheldon party at Elaine's? I, I'm trying to. I'm trying, I know we've known you for a while, but I can't remember where we. I actually called mom this morning. I said, I think I'm going to do that. Do you have any stories about when Matt first saw me? And she said, I got a diamond pin for Brian. I got diamond earrings for Matthew, and nothing when you were born. <laughs> That's really not relevant, but. It isn't, but nobody owes her. He's here. <laughs> well, uh, Julie, I want to first thank Politics and Pros in Washington, D.C., and Books and Books in Miami, and Harvard Books uh, there at Harvard for hosting tonight's event. Um, for Julie Clam and her new book, The Almost Legendary Morris Sisters, which Menachem Kaiser in the New York Times calls lovely, it's easy and pleasurable to follow Clam wherever she goes. Uh, it's a warm, enthusiastic review, the kind that every writer loves. And uh, the book has also received wonderful reviews in the Washington Post and other places. Now, Julie, if memory serves, you're the author of uh, the New York Times bestseller, You Had Me at Woof, Love at First Spark, Friend Keeping, Please Excuse My Daughter, and The Stars in Her Eyes. Um, and now uh, you are my sister, and I know <laughs> you very well. Or at least I think I know you very well, because we're related. <laughs> I also know how, to, I know how to make you laugh. We have a lot of inside jokes, mm -hmm. but there are also things I'm not sure I completely understand about you, your early resistance to Thai food, for example. <laughs> but the things I know 
and don't know remain fixed in my mind, despite the fact that we're hardly ever in the same place, getting to know each other even better. Do you see where I'm going with this? I assume I know you well, but when I dove into your new book, I learned new things about you, like the fact that you see dead people. <laughs> you talk to them, and apparently you always have, and that actually leads us to our topic for tonight's broadcast, um, the almost legendary Morris Sisters, subtitled A True Story of Family Fiction. And that leads me back to this sort of rhetorical question, which I now uh, present here. What parts about you that I know are in fact true, and what parts are merely assembled in my imagination to create a story about you that I tell myself? And with that, I'd like to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, could you read the, the uh, paragraph we discussed on page 237? Yes. Yes, I shall. You are captain of this ship, Matthew Clam. Um, in the beginning, I was fact checking the history of the Mora sisters that I'd heard from my family. And so many times I felt deeply disappointed to be thwarted by the lack of proof that there had ever been a White House visit or a copy of the letter from Golda Meir or a handkerchief from JP Morgan. But despite those tantalizing missing details, what I am left with now and what I can share with my family too, are their lives. Like why their father put them in the orphanage and what their mother suffered through and what it took for these four sisters to get where they got. What made them each in their own way, difficult and wonderful, annoying and confident. How a person like Marcella could have had this truly storybook arc from beginning from being born in a country that didn't want her to walking a thousand miles across Europe. Wait a minute. To walking a thousand miles across Europe to crossing an ocean in steerage, to losing her mother in the worst imaginable way, to gathering her sisters in New York, to making ten million dollars. Every bit of it entirely on her own through nothing but sheer will and stubbornness, and yes, maybe some meanness. It doesn't matter whether or not she slept with JP Morgan or advised FDR. It doesn't matter that high button shoes wasn't stolen from Ruth. What matters is these four sisters forged an incredible life out of almost nothing, and they are my cousins. Beautiful. Um, but if we're going to get through all of my questions, you're going to have to read much faster. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't have to read. Um, it's your idea. Uh, <laughs> so you wrote a book about our distant cousins, four mm. sisters who smoked a lot of cigarettes, made millions of dollars, and were either crazy or weird. Every time I think of the Mars sisters, I imagine Marge sis Simpson's sisters, um, Patty and Selma. <laughs> and I wonder if the characters of Patty and Selma are actually based on any of the Mars. <laughs> but seriously, I, um, let's just get serious for a moment. I see you dedicated the book to Claire Manowitz. Who is this Claire Manowitz and how is she involved? Claire um, is my dad's cousin. Um, she was, um, uh, we used to have these cousins club when I was growing up with my family and um, my parents would have all these, the distant cousins come um, uh, the, and Claire was my dad's age ish, but she was very, very cool. And to me, she always reached out to me and, and said, I was also, I also had two older siblings or maybe she was the middle and I hated them and plotted their death. So I relate to you and I'm gonna take you and we're gonna get away from them. So I would visit her in the Keys in Florida. She was just amazing, hilarious. And she was the one who told me all about the Morris sisters. She was very close to them. Um, I see, that's very interesting. I think I also remember that at some point she sent um, a cassette tape. Mm -hmm. She sent it to you. Yes, and, and then insisted that this was a story that needed to be told. And I remember mm -hmm. listening to it in the car once, and then I gave it to you. Yeah, I wanted it. I had. I wasn't even writing then, but I just wanted it. I wanted Claire's voice on a tape, you know. And this was when so I was on eighty. So this must have been like in the eighties. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
that was a long time ago because I listened to it in my solo apartment. And it started, Claire was from um, New Jersey and she said, the Mara sisters, an impossible dream. <laughs> and and um, we made the line, an impossible dream, like a family uh, joke for like- Yeah, she, uh, but she, was, that, she was throwing a title out for future use and I was very appreciative, but I didn't, it was t obviously many years later, you know, the eighties were what, 10 years ago, <laughs> um, that I actually thought of doing this book and discovered you know, this incredible, these incredible lives. We're going to get to that. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to jump the gun there. So I always thought that we were descended from dukes, barons, queens, kings, mayors, famous generals, important religious figures, but it turns out that at least some of our family is not. <laughs> Can you remind us why these ancestors fled Romania? And can you characterize their lives at all before they fled? Well, I went to Romania. Um, but I also read a lot about it. Um, they lived in a very tiny town with a synagogue. Um, this was around, you know, um, from like 18, they were, they, the, they were born in the 1890s and early 1900s. So this is at that time. Yeah. I don't know what century that is, but somebody smarter than me would know. The 20th century. Anyway, um, they, um, they, they, it was, very, it was, you know, a very simple life, but the dad was a photographer there and he wanted yeah. to be a movie director in Hollywood. And like 1900, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, it wasn't like now or even in the fifties. So it was kind of impressive. They had a little tiny bit of money. They weren't destitute. And then they walked to, from this little town in Romania to, uh, the, Liver, uh, not Liverpool, Southampton um, was where the, uh, in England, I mean, they didn't do it in like one day, um, but they, and then they took this steamship to Ellis Island. They walked across Europe because it was basically illegal to be Jewish in Romania at that time. Right. It was, it was, it was not good. Um, it was, uh, they, they walked, they had maybe a wagon ride or whatever, but one of the things that the my Romanian guide friend told me was that poor people didn't leave, only uh, people that had a little bit of money. If you were really poor, you couldn't get out of there. You couldn't even afford to leave. That's, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. I actually forgot um, until I read the book that you went to Romania and I was very moved by that section, which I want to talk about. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about your method. And if you could read that other section we discussed on page 39, if All you still right. have it marked. Okay, I do. Okay, it's this is chapter four, and the and the title of the chapter is Step One: colon, Index Cards. To start my journey toward greater clarity, I bought two different multicolored packs of index cards, and on the coffee table in the living room, I separated them into colors. Each color I decided would be assigned to a family member, and the leftover colors would be for the places they live. After making this determination, which felt like a significant accomplishment, I stared at the index cards for a couple of weeks without writing anything on them. Everyone in my family kept knocking them off the table, so I frequently had to recollate. Wait, we... <laughs> and and there was there was one more line here that I loved, which oh. was, "I'm telling you this because I really had no idea where to begin." <laughs> oh, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing, but index cards seemed like, you know, every anybody who knew, who does research, right? They have tons of index cards and, and all the information. And even when I finished the book, I the index cards each had, there was like five index cards that each had like one word written on them. I never used them. <laughs> it seemed like a perfectly viable system. And maybe and if I'm going to write another book and that book is going to use those index cards. I do feel like you could right now teach a class on how to instruct people on how to write a book like this because of all of the sort of trap doors and back doors and hidden buttons and all those things you learned um, in years researching well, people. I, you know, the thing about it is there are these like brilliant genealogists and archivists, 
family, they're like family history archivists and, um, uh, and those people could teach much better than I could. I, I mean, I was um, very much like stumbling around in the dark, you know, and like amazingly finding something and then looking in the totally wrong places for something else. I mean, in the book, I mentioned that I spent um, a couple of days in the New York Public Library and the only thing I was able to find was the bathroom. <laughs> That's, um, and there's, there are a couple of moments. So I don't know where we, <laughs> where we landed on this idea about their, uh, whether you were gonna do any spoilers or anything. I mean, there's this great scene where you go to the, to the Morgan Library and, uh, and then you pick up, uh, uh, the biography of J.P. Morgan. So one of the many stories that had been told for some time and passed mm -hmm. out was that Marcella, who was the money maker among mm -hmm. them, had a torrid affair with J.P. Morgan, which then perhaps led to the fact that she became this amazing commodities trader who, when women weren't even doing anything near Wall Street, mm -hmm. made 10 million or more dollars. Um, but you had, you had a moment where you realized that might not have been the case. Can you tell us just a tiny smidge about that? Yes, I opened the, I, I bought this very thick biography and I came home and I was, first I looked in the index for her name, it was not there. Huh. So I just started reading and I, and then I thought, wait a minute, something is funny here. These years seem very off. Oh, wait. He died in 1912 when Marcella was in Rome, when Marcella was in an orphanage in St. Louis. So, you know what? Two and two didn't add up. And then I thought, oh, maybe they meant J.P. Morgan Jr. So then I went, I was like, oh, it's J.P. Morgan Jr., blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, um, I talked to one of my um, most important um, uh, advisors in this book, Unky Hoib, and he said, I think it was Harold Beish, who was Prudential Beish, and then, and that was kind of what I started to figure out. There was a lot of things, like you said, stories you know, it's like, you know, somebody was, he heard that and didn't know who that was and sort of transposed it in their head to J.P. Morgan, so. Um, and uh, can you tell us a tiny bit about each, so can you, like, which is the one who refused to sleep indoors, had many lovers around the world who anointed her with oils, <laughs> Which was the one who made tons of money trading pork bellies? Which one smoked cigarettes and while in the hospital toward the end of her life had to put a cigarette in the hole in her trachea? <laughs> and which one um, was um, the normal one who like I maybe one of our uncles referred to as the normal one? Was no, that the no, one? She, no, she wasn't. That, that was okay. So the one who smoked out of her trachea was Malvina. Great. Uh, she was a uh, the the sweetest one she had was born with a disability and had a very hard mm -hmm. uh you know time she had to go into a cripple's home that's what mm -hmm. they called it the orphanage yeah um that was malvina uh marcella was the mo money one she mm -hmm. was the uh commodity trader she traded in uh winter corn and pork bellies mm -hmm. um selma the oldest was she had a beautiful singing voice matthew <laughs> gorgeous and she was very beautiful, but she was, um, as some people in our family referred to her, they said that she never stopped talking and she was batshit. But that, we don't use those words anymore. And then Ruth was the one who was, she was a playwright and a bohemian. She was all about free love. She, you know, did a, in Claire, had, Claire had her for Thanksgiving and she did a headstand. She was like in her 60s, did a headstand and she was wearing bloomers under her dress. And they knew it because her dress came up and fell over her head. Right, because if you're doing a headstand, that's what happens. Right, sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, daddy, my, our dad, rem daddy, our dad, he, he told me he remembered that she had in her purse the atomizer perfume thing and he thought it was called A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. <laughs> But I, I, that also seems like something that you would think like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe probably not, but I like it. You, you, just, it exotic. you described um, a very um, annoying uh, clerk when you were in Romania who uh, had cat eye glasses and refused to help you guys and screamed at somebody for even asking a question. And you, you described her as a Pixar character. But I started thinking when I was reading the book that all the sisters sounded a little bit like Pixar characters. Yeah, yeah, I know. It would make a really good movie, don't you think? Yes, I do. I can't stand it. It's got to be made into a movie. Um, <laughs> do you want to read one short other paragraph on page 46 that we discussed? Yes, yes. yes. 
I will read that right now. Um, okay, do you want to set it up? Bye. <laughs> okay, so this is from the um, the yearbook. Uh, this is from Marcella's yearbook that I found. Um, uh, it's called The Script. Um, and she went to this smart um, high school in St. Louis. Um, elsewhere in the script, the sold down yearbook, I found a page called The Lineup, which listed each student's name, favorite saying, hobby, hangout, and greatest desire. This is like 1921. Mar Marcella's favorite saying was, well, listen here. Below her, Myra Latta's favorite saying was, oh, giggle. While Jane Newman liked to say, that's the cutest thing I ever saw. Marcello's hobbies were arguing. Other students' hobbies were, included wearing short sleeves and chewing gum and talking baby talk. The greatest desires from her classmates were to jump rope, to be married, to be attractive, to vamp boys. Marcella's greatest desire? To ride in an airplane. She wrote aeroplane. It was clear that she was very unique. I, I love that section because it gets, it gives us a little bit of a sense of her voice and it also gives us a little bit of sense of already how these, she's not fitting in. Right. Her, 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 um, <laughs> her yearbook quote was thoughts of great deeds are mine. I mean, it, she was like yeah. ready to go. So, yeah. yeah. So for, you know, girls who. Yeah. 1920. Got shoved yeah. into an orphanage. So you have this way of intuiting. And I just want to, on, on the page before, there were photographs of the, uh, there's a photograph of Marcella on one page and then Ruth on the next page. And you make this observation that because of the state of her hair, Marcella looks like a girl who has no mother. And then you told us a little bit about the uh, availability of, in the way of curling irons in 1921. And I started thinking, well, this is just a little uh, bit of a leap of faith, isn't it? <laughs> but then I started looking at the next page. And in fact, her sister Ruth has a hairdo that could only be the result of neglect. It's the photo from the New York Times Review, and it's not a good hairdo, which makes me think you were right. And I guess what I want to ask you is, how long did it take you before you got to the point where you felt like you could make these kind of intuitive leaps and have, you know, real insights into their experiences? Um, it took me a while. I started to feel like, you know, and and obviously, I don't know this. They may it may have been a complete choice. There were a lot, a few things that I made the leap, just like you know, the stories that were not really, uh, you know, for sure true. But, you know, um, this, I, I talked to one um, amazing genealogy teacher, and she said to me, genealogy is not finding proof, it's finding evidence, not always finding proof, it's finding evidence. So just looking through the yearbook, every girl in the yearbook had, you know, flat ironed hair, mm -hmm. um, and they had like, you know, froze kind of. Um, yes. So. Um, yeah, I don't know what you call that hairdo of Ruth's, but it's <laughs> like one you do on purpose. It's a little like Marge Simpson if yeah. it was uh, not blue. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, let it go straight up for sure. <laughs> it was a little, you know, but then, you know, that, so that's what I thought, you know, I, sure. and, um, but I mean, I was, a, uh, I, I had a child who his hair was a mess in their school pictures and I think I was a pretty good mother. So maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I want to take a step back and say a few words about you. Somewhere along the way, I started to notice your interest in, and maybe even belief in what I might call a life beyond our planet. And what I'm talking about is there were illustrations or statues or candles or whatever of the moon with a face, as in the man in the moon. Mm -hmm. And you used to anyway, I'm not sure right now in your apartment, but you used to have a lot of these things around. And I thought this was charming, but visiting your apartment at one point, it seemed like everywhere I looked, the friendly face of the moon stared back at me. And I started to wonder, and I got the sense, I'm sorry. Can you see where my finger's pointing? Are you? <laughs> That's yeah. the moon from, um, Trip to the Moon, my friend yeah. that Resnick gave me as a wedding gift because everybody. I loved love that. Yeah. Sorry. And I got the sense that you had a good relationship with the moon and mm -hmm. perhaps with other planets as well, and that you felt connected to these non terrestrial habitats, if mm -hmm. you will, which leads me to connect this sort of interest of yours with your interest in spirits and the afterlife and in 
people who are elsewhere no longer with us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You can comment on that or I can keep going. I'm just- well, I mean, I, I, I think that I, I mean, I very, very strongly, I'm not a like religious person, but I very strongly feel like there's much more um, out there than we're aware of. And it's kind of like, what what's the harm in talking to them? I, I do feel, I mean, I'm not walking the, down the street saying like, what do you think of that, Marcella? But in my head, when I'm doing things, I'm like, help me out here. Or, you know, or I feel them being like, you know, it's okay. This is good. This is okay. I mean, when I went, you know, I did went to that, uh, to a medium to talk to them. And, um, uh, you know, I was really hoping that it was going to be like, I was going to, she was going to be like, okay, we have uh Selma's here, Malvina's here, Marcella's here, and Ruth is here. What do you want to ask? And it was not quite that direct of a line, but um, but you know, it was it was it was helpful anyway. Um, one of the things that she said they said was they didn't want it to be a joke like Grey Gardens. You know, they didn't want to be made fun of. And I really thought like if like I was in the um, in the afterworld. <laughs> World. Um, and I was communicating with somebody who was going to write a book about me. I would say, don't make me look like an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't care if you can find my, you know, the keys to my whatever. Yeah. So you, for example, you had, you write about at least one dream you had where the sisters spoke to you mm -hmm. and one, one dream where they told you they were sorry to hear about the closing of the Carnegie Deli. No, that was, they told that to the med, the medium, the medium oh. told me, she said, um, you know, she told me the things that they said. And then at the end she said, Oh wait, they want to say they're sorry. The Carnegie Deli closed. And I said, I am too. So, so, um, but you know, more generally and seriously, you, heard their voices and the voice of their mother when you walk through certain places around mm -hmm. in this country and abroad. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, do you have a sense of what each of the sisters would order at the deli? Mm -hmm. But I guess what I seriously want to ask you is, is it comforting to engage with your departed ancestors? And I guess what I mean also is that, um, it, was it a comfort to learn about the Mars sisters? Is it a comfort for you to know um, I don't know about the way people who are no longer here, who you didn't know, like just sort of taking it, understanding the shape of their lives, or was it even a choice for you to be interested? Do you feel like, I don't know, like dead people speak to you or whatever? Like I'm obviously, you literally hear them, but are you always like a willing participant or would you rather be interested in like rock climbing, but you feel like you're sort of pulled to tell their story? Um, you know, I, I, I do feel, I, I mean, I don't, I think that when I was working on this, I was so like, you know, lost in trying to find facts that I was really literally doing whatever I could. And it actually was, um, I went to a, um, when I was, when I was uh, uh, single, I went to a workshop where you learned how to communicate with dogs. And the woman who did it was the premier dog communicator said, you know, if you imagine the conversation in your head with the dog, it's usually right. Well, um, I decided that what if I was imagining it or, or it was real, it was helpful. Does that sound completely insane? No, I mean, I, look, I, writers spend all their time sitting in a room alone talking to themselves and it's like, yeah. So, so, so some of it is, um, you know, some of it with, I feel like I'm so happy that I was able to tell their story because they didn't have children. They were cremated because they didn't want anybody pissing on their graves. And, you know, it's sort of the thing of like to bear witness where I am not letting them be forgotten. And whatever happens, that is, they're in this they're here. They, they're, they're, what they did is not going unnoticed and forgotten. Um, so. That's Julie. That's beautiful. Um, the subtitle of the, of your book, the almost legendary Morris sisters is a true story of family fiction. And I believe it was Grace Paley who said any story told twice is fiction. 
The Morris sisters uh, lived in Southampton for many years and in their wills, they bequeathed a substantial sum to the Southampton library. And there's a plaque in the library in a room named after the Morris sisters. And there is a story of the Morris sisters on the plaque. And like a lot of what you believed at first, it has some errors in it. Um, and that info I learned in your book came from our cousin, Bobby, who ran the Morris Foundation. The Morris Foundation pretty much beginning and ending with Bobby writing that somewhat erroneous info on that plaque. Is that correct? Yeah. And, you know, and and like it, it's he I think they said write a story about them. They were they were gone. He was their executor. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, he he tried to fill in as much as he could with what he knew and what he thought. Um, and in the same way with Claire, they, you know, they had heard things and um, uh, they and they and that's what they passed on. So I thought that, you know, I mean, I, it's actually a really beautifully written thing that he did. Uh -huh. um, it mostly isn't true, but in it, in it, it wouldn't have mattered if I never found that out. I mean, nobody in there going in there is like under false pretenses that they were, you know, whatever. So that sort of leads me to my next point, which is, so um, uh, in like page 50 something, you discovered that this one really big essential part of the story of Claire, their mother was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and then you went back to Claire, our cousin, and you said, hey, what is the deal here? And she's like, okay, let me tell you the real story. You yeah. made these other really interesting discoveries like at the in J.P. Morgan's biography. Mm -hmm. You also ran into an old, uh, a, a, a confidant, old friend of yours whose famous book editor and writer father wrote a fake biography of Alger Hiss, and the Alger Hiss Society gave him an award, which yeah. leads me to- Triple Right, which leads me to, um, uh, think back to when you wrote your first first book, Please Excuse My Daughter, and I disagreed with you about how many bedrooms there were in the house where we grew up, which then makes me wonder, how important is the truth? In politics, obviously it matters. We live in a time where half the country can't even hear the question. The other one is asking. But does it matter what a family believes about itself and about its various members? Are we even able to grasp the facts about each other? And is it even wise? Is it better to create your own version of a loved one so that you can love that loved one more easily? I mean, I think it, um, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but I, I don't think it matters if it's true or not. There are families that tell stories that they know aren't true, but they need to tell them in a certain way to make their family feel like, you know, our grandfather, he, you know, he wasn't a, a hobo on a, the back of a train. He was a conductor, you know, or, and, and the thing about it is like, I, I have this feeling like, I used to think like, if I was like completely, you know, out of touch with reality, and I thought that I was, you know, the queen of uh, Barcelona, <laughs> what difference would it make if I was or I wasn't? I mean, to, in my mind, like, and that's something that's kind of scary to me. Like the, the truth really doesn't matter if like you're walking around thinking it's the truth, I mean, maybe. <laughs> is that is that crazy? No, that's a beautiful answer. So <laughs> I now I want to just talk a tiny bit about the afterlife. So uh, a 2010 60 Minutes poll found that 65% of Americans believe that some people go to heaven, mm -hmm. hell, or purgatory. 7% believe they go to another dimension. I don't know what that means. 6% believe basically in reincarnation. Uh, 10 or 12% uh, believe that there isn't. Uh, any afterlife and uh, some other percentage just don't know. When I was reading your book, like you have these beautiful, warm, connected moments where you think about them looking down on you. And you say, I don't remember where it was, but you had this beautiful thing where you said that you had imagined our departed grandparents and the people who you knew and loved actually in what seemed to you almost like a spaceship that is hovering over the earth and you can and they're looking out their little windows down at us and at a certain point because you spend enough time kind of caring for the Mars sisters and I guess loving them in some way they suddenly were on the on the spacecraft with um the rest of the crew mm -hmm. and that was very um like beautiful and I mean even though we're making a joke about it like I do think that you believe this stuff and I sort of oh, felt at times something like, that, sorry no I'm, I'm, I'm moved by it please I I I, I started to Think that when I was a little kid, when I was a very little kid, I, you know, I saw kids on TV that um, would pray by their bedside and say, uh -huh. you know, 
dear God, please make Scrappy live, you know, and get rid of his cancer, whatever the thing was. Uh Um, And so I knew that you were supposed to pray for things for other people. So I would definitely in like pray. So in my head, I would say, dear God, I hope you are having a nice time and everybody is well and you're and you are taking care of all of my family in heaven. And because I grew up on Rankin Bass, I guess, I imagined him to look sort of like the Santa in the Rankin Bass uh, uh, cartoons in his pie shapes, you know, the the 1950s uh, flying saucer, taking everybody around. And I still think of like my friend Lisa who died in that spaceship, I, you know, uh, (laughs) and I, I decided to write about it because why the hell not, you know? It's, oh, oh no, they're taking me away. <laughs> so, um, uh, sorry, I'm just toggling back and forth here for a second. So I, I was like going to jokingly say like, do you believe that heaven is like cheers where everybody knows your name and drinks beer and laughs with Norm? I'm not going to, you can, you can, um, you can have your own uh, idea and you don't even have to verbalize it if you don't want to about um, what you think. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I really hope there's more than just this. I mean, I, I really hope this is, we're not just dirt in the ground after this. That's my, that's my wish. And I do imagine that it's, you know, hot fudge Sundays on clouds and stuff. <laughs> wow. Well, that's great. I mean, um, terrific. I yeah. maybe, um, I should try that sometime. Um, uh, so I did, actually totally forget you went to Romania until I was reading your book. I actually, when I first got it, I opened it up kind of at random and I was in this scene where you were trying to get a hamburger in <laughs> Romania. And that was really funny because the um, people there were just sort of offended that you walked into their restaurant and ordered food from them. They were just like, wait, what, are, what yeah. is going on you here? It comes to restaurants at night in Romania. They like had to turn the lights on and, and she had um, one she brought one hamburger and I was like, I meant one for each of us. And then, and then she was like, you know, why don't you get out of here? We're screwing around with that kind of request. But we, we had our two hamburgers and they were such the best hamburger I ever had in my life. Well, that's actually and that leads me, for four hours, but well, that's really beautiful. And that does lead me to my next question. So there, there, you were in this place, it was outside of Bucharest and you actually like had these moments. Like when I think of my, our ancestors, my feeling is sort of fluid. Like when I was in Israel, I went through these villages where there were like women in long skirts and men in beards. And I was like, maybe wherever the shtetl we came from looked like that. Other times I get like this twinge watching like Borat. And I'm like, oh, we must have had a cow in the kitchen. And I know you had these sort of highs and lows in your trip to Romania. Like you saw where maybe the family had come from and it looked kind of like a set from Chernobyl, the HBO or whatever that TV show was like, even at its best sad and crummy and now abandoned and falling apart. And then you also had this beautiful scene you wrote about in this like neo-Gothic building that has this ancient beer hall. And it was actually like still functioning or it had been functioning when they were there. And it was this ornate, beautiful building that looked like it could have been in Paris. Mm -hmm. You described beautiful streets and you described um places that yeah yeah i mean the thing about romania is they they it's it's like a you know a beautiful it was a beautiful country and then when the communists came in they did all of that horrible brutalist architecture so they got rid of a lot of the beautiful things but some things remained um and what i guess was i was so moved by was like we're in this beautiful old European place Mm -hmm. you might see in Paris and you're sitting there and you're like having a beer and a dinner and all the smell sounded like our grandmother's kitchen. And it's just beautiful paragraph you wrote about the smell of dill and some other stuff. And it, it just hit me like, this is a real place. And I started to get this heavy feeling sad, but also just big that our great grandparents who lived there and did whatever were from an actual place albeit one we barely know the name of, but then the sort of sweep of like inherited trauma like came through so much of what like I feel is my connection to the past. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and and I felt that the feeling of being you know sort of hated by your country and thrown away. And then you have this beautiful line on page one fifty two. You wrote the sadness in this place was overwhelming. The people oh you were in the cemetery at this time. The people buried here had been forgotten by the living. I hope their souls were off somewhere having a nice party. And I thought that was really beautiful. And then I guess I also wondered, although you might have really answered this by now, like while you were writing, how many times did you hold out the hope that somebody's going to do a kind of archaeological dig on you and remember you? No. <laughs> I think I've written enough about myself that nobody has to figure it out. Plus, the internet, there's a trace of me every single and uh, every single J. Crew sale site, they can you know go and see what I put in my cart and never bought. But um, you know, I think that um, the the thing about coming from another country the way they did yeah. is they they couldn't bring any. I mean, they could bring very. I I was telling talking to another interviewer, and I said I always imagine them having that bindle stick with the spotted handkerchief that they took, um, but so much what they brought here was in their minds, their, their traditions, mm. their recipes, their, you know, the, their values. So, so one of the things about being in Romania was like, here is all the things they left behind. They couldn't take the, the, the beautiful fabrics and the colors and the smells were like, it was like, I walked in there and I was like, we're in grandma Billy's house and she's making um, stuffed cabbage. So, and I loved it and I, and it was so powerful to me. And I was there with my husband and he liked it, but he didn't have that connection yeah. to it. So yeah. it really was a, a, a family thing. I think. Yeah. So, so um, it is funny that they, so, so they had millions of dollars. They lived in at for the last big chunk of their life in Southampton mm -hmm. and Southampton, not just in Southampton, but on gin lane. I find it to be an interesting, although odd choice. Southampton is so incredibly preppy that if you, I know this because I've taught there for years, if you go to sleep in anything other than your golfing attire, the town constable will find you for being out of order. I mean, it's got all kinds of great things, but the town itself is very preppy. And as opposed to say East Hampton, like super waspy, Gin Lane is like the apex of the ritzy part of Southampton. It's like a Hollywood movie set with like, you know, grass cut with a straight razor. And what I was thinking was for the sisters, Southampton felt pretty much like every other place in the world or in America, but maybe the world too, which is not all that welcoming. Maybe it didn't matter to them where they were, like whether a better beach town was somewhere else because all the places in their lives said do not enter, but they entered them anyway. Right. That's, that's an that's a, a amazing point. Yeah, it is. I mean, they also lived in the village in on Perry street or like near Perry street. They lived in, in like really cool bohemian, places that they must have chosen that they wanted to go there. You know, that was the, you know, in the, in the 1920s down there, it was really arty and, and, you know, so they, they had these ideas of things that they wanted in their life. And I'm sure that they, you know, they, they could have picked a different town and they, maybe someone said Southampton is the nicest. So they picked that. There are there is a whole essential sort of theme that we haven't covered, and I know we're getting close to running out of time here, which is the fact that these women, I mean, the playwright, Ruth, actually, she wrote plays. She she came close to having stuff put up in, in, in real places mm -hmm. and at one point um, sued um, another playwright who she insisted had stolen her idea that then became a movie. Is that right? Yeah. And, they were just like super empowered, like Marcella, the one who made all those millions of dollars trading. Like there was nobody. Right. Um, you mentioned the woman who the first woman, I forget her name, who bought the first seat on the New York Stock Exchange. And that was maybe in the 80s, you know, and she was doing this stuff in the. Right, right, right. Well, her, another thing Herbie said was that you just didn't see women doing anything. You know, mm -hmm. at, at, you know, he was big in that business all those years. And he said you, you, there weren't women. Um, and, and, you know, there, there was a, I wrote about, um, Vic, uh, Victoria Woodhull who ran for president. She and her sister had a business, um, on wall street and, the, and they ended up, you know, having to shut it down because they were getting too much attention. So the Morris sisters were very, let's not call attention to it. We'll just do our thing quietly. And, you know, and then somebody will write a book about us when we're dead. <laughs> um, 
I, if I go on any longer, I will have gone past the amount of time. Do we, is there a question is, I don't know if Christina's on, um, oh, and here she comes. Hey, there is a question. Um, and here we go. Were the Morris sisters as gorgeous as you two? <laughs> is it from my mother? <laughs> it doesn't say. <laughs> no, the answer is impossible. That's the impossible dream. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys are so good together. Uh, I have been so laughing great. here the whole oh, time. That's so great. You it's really so are. You have this weird. like wonderful way with each other. And you can tell you have a lot of mutual respect and love too. We're but missing you know, our other brother who is hilarious and we miss him on this. So story. why isn't he here? <laughs> you know what? Next time he's going to be. Absolutely. We should bring because him. then when we get out of line, there'll be somebody that, uh, you know, <laughs> he's older than us. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Um, this one is from Kimberly. What was the most surprising thing you learned about them during your research? Um, you know, I think the most, the most surprising thing, I mean, there were like facts which are in the book that were shocking. And there's a lot of that. But I really think the most surprising uh, emotion that I had was realizing that these women who I saw as like old ladies had had been like children who'd gone through like incredibly difficult things. It was like when you're a little kid, you imagine old people sort of just popping into the world as old people. And when you're, you know, and then you're, you know, and then I'm thinking like, you know, they weren't, you know, hardened from the start. They really went through a lot. But there are like um, some some big, there were some very big things that shocked me. Um, but I think people should read the book. I mean, at one point, you had this great moment where you walked through um, the insane asylum. Uh, the dollhouse, Matthew, the dollhouse. Oh. <laughs> when, when, I, when we were kids, my mom made a dollhouse. I ruined me, Christmas. For me. And at the dinner table, Matt, and it was a surprise, and Matt goes, uh, I'm so excited that we finished the dollhouse. And it was before Christmas. And my mom was like, so this dollhouse, my, my book, but that's okay. Okay, here's one from Tammy. She would like to know, which sister did you relate to and why? I definitely related to Ruth, the writer, and partly because Claire always said you would have loved her stories, and I, I put one of her stories in the book. Um, it's actually, that was totally fine, Matthew, just in case you have a funny feeling. I didn't get to it. You didn't really um, dollhouse the book. Um, uh, um, what was I just saying? What was so you, re you related to Ruth? Oh, Ruth, because... Because, oh, and I wrote it, put one of her stories in the book um, because she was a beautiful writer. She, in high school, wrote this incredible story. Um, so I related to that, you know, wanting her wanting to, you know, do something different. I, 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 I always thought we would have had fun together. Okay, here is another one. Uh, what about your family produced two writers with such a great sense of humor? And it was just neglect. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are both very funny. And but my brother's a terrific writer too. He's yeah, he's a, a award as a copywriter. He's probably the best of writer of all of us. So three. What do you think was the quality that they had that made them shatter the glass ceiling of that time? This is from Vesna. Um I I I, somebody must have made them feel that they were uh, loved and important, and maybe it was each other. Um, maybe they they maybe they needed to save themselves, and maybe they saved they needed to save each other. Um, and that's kind of where because it, you know they certainly weren't like brilliantly parented. Um, and they never got the message on smoking, by the way. And it didn't matter because they lived to be like in their upper 90s. So maybe we should all smoke. <laughs> maybe. 
Uh, so here's, I'm not sure if this is a question. It seems like a comment. It says, Matt are the prince of goofy feet since Julie is the princess. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where that's coming from, but it's, I wrote in the book because I have very bad feet. Um, Got it. Um, but I'm me and my mom and I are the only ones. Everybody else has normal feet. <laughs> <laughs> so I love, I love the, the the whole idea of family fiction. Hmm. Can you just speak to that just a little bit, like because that's such an interesting concept. Um, one thing I was thinking when my when my editor and I were talking about a subtitle, he was saying he was sort of throwing around like a, a true story of family lies. And I said, they're not lies because they're um, uh, they're they're I think fiction is a softer word because it's um, it's, you know, what we need to create, what people need to create. For their families um you know i think and i think everybody has their family fiction one of the things i've been finding really interesting you know the book's only been out a few days but people are telling me i heard this and they tell me this long story about somebody in their family you know who was at you know the alamo and this and that and they're like uh, now i'm not sure if i want to like go and see if they were actually there i mean you know <laughs> that all informs who you are. Like if you think, you know, I, I start the book with saying, my mother told me that we were related to Irving Berlin and we were not. <laughs> but for a while I was really grooving on that. Um, we were related to uh, Julius Irving. <laughs> the, uh, the idea of um, family stories that are, uh, that morph over time, I think is just, it is also in the book and it's really, it's, it's explored in depth. And I think when I read that Grace Paley quote, you know, any story told twice is fiction. I think the Morris sisters attracted so much attention in the family and people talked about them a lot. Yeah. We and did they, have like, like a lot of dazzling characters. So yeah. that's a big one. Yeah. And it engaged people's imagination. So maybe they projected onto the Morris sisters a little bit more than just, this is a woman making, you know, millions and millions of dollars at a time when no one, but, you know, in her, her gender does that kind of thing. Right. right. So instead of just there. being a millionaire um, from Wall Street, she had to be the first woman with a Jew seat on the Jewish, uh, first Jewish woman with a seat on the stock exchange, which was not at all true. Um, and I think the bloomers also did a lot to jack up the whole energy of the myth. Mm -hmm. That it's, was true. It's, fa it's a fascinating idea. It's really, really fascinating. Um, and you know, also what you were saying, Matthew, about how writers spend so much time talking to their characters, too, and like sitting alone and, you know, imagining and reimagining and, oh, my God, really, really interesting stuff. So um, I think that's it as far as questions. And we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so, so much for having me. I want to thank you both for supporting indie bookstores. And maybe we can end by asking you, you know, what are you reading or like, or maybe share like a favorite story about your own indie bookstore? Well, okay. um, go ahead, you go. You go, you go first. No, you go first. Well, Politics and Prose is my local bookstore. It's just a few minutes from my house and it's a great place. Um, <clears throat> and I've been reading Patricia Lockwood's book, Priest Daddy, which is a memoir that came out in 2017, and also reading Alice McDermott's new book, which is a, a craft book called What About the Baby? Um, and it's very inside baseball, but I love it. Um, my favorite, is that, did you say favorite indie bookstore? The one that I love, that I, that I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I actually love when I did a book tour, uh, Books and Books, but the one close to me or in my heart is um, Books Are Magic in Brooklyn, um, owned by Emma Straub and her husband, Mikey Fusco Straub. And um, I, yeah, and I am reading um, this book now, Seek You. Um, a, it's a, a Journey Through American Loneliness by Kristen Radke. Um, it's so good. Mm -hmm. And I'm also reading Alison Bechtel's I'm into graphic books now. Um, mm -hmm. Her book, which is I, I the first remember. one, Funhouse. No, the one now about exercising. <laughs> it's oh, yeah, I yeah. Them both in books are magic. That's great. That's um, great. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm into books and pictures. 
<laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thanks for supporting us on behalf of Books and Books, Politics and Prose, and Harvard Bookstore. We're just delighted to have been here with you tonight. Thanks for coming to our thank virtual you. space. Thank you. Tech thank you so notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I hope that we will see you in person sometime soon. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, and thanks to everyone watching. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening, everyone.